good to see you. I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to the big questions on this snowy Sunday. Now, this week, uh, a House of Lords committee said Britain's economy has gained very little from immigration. But there's more to immigration than pounds and pence. There's the moral and family values that immigrants bring. Yesterday, Mr Justice Coleridge said our urban family life is in meltdown. Our first big question, can immigrants make Britain more moral? Now, you may disagree with what I say, but will you defend to the death my right to say it? A Dutch film suggesting the Quran inspires violence was withdrawn from a British website this week because of death threats from Muslims. Our next big question, do we have the right to offend? And our last big question of the current series, one that is fundamental to many believers, does the devil exist? We're back at West London Academy in Northall with a local audience who've made it here through the snow and the cold on this um, spring morning. And we have on our panel in the posh seats uh, a distinguished gathering. The Right Reverend Tom Butler, Bishop of Southwark, writer and broadcaster Christina Adoni, Costa Prize winning novelist Alison Kennedy and Rabbi Yitzhak Shockett from the Mill Hill Synagogue. And our special guest is the scientist and untiring champion of atheism. Some people reckon he's the devil, Professor Richard Dawkins. <laughs> For centuries, Britain has become a new home to people fleeing religious persecution like the Huguenots or the Jews, people fleeing political oppression, uh, many who've come here just to make a better life for themselves and their families. And they've also brought their religious ideas and their own moral values, which uh, may be just the thing to rescue us from our social problems. At the start of uh, this series of The Big Questions, a poll conducted for us by Comrades found that 83% of the 1,000 adults surveyed believe that Britain is in moral decline. Can immigration make Britain more moral? Christina Adoni, I mean, this judge was talking about the cancer of society that is family breakdown and what is needed it, it maybe is a sort of injection of values. He didn't say this, but what do you think about the contention that maybe some of the moral values, the family values, brought here by immigrants can save us from ourselves? I think that's, that's a very, very interesting theory, and I think absolutely just so. You know, we've been taught uh, since 2007, that since July 2007, that I the immigrant community is basically a breeding ground for terrorism. Actually, I think it's a breeding ground for a fantastic value system. And when you look at where these immigrants come from, they usually come from, well, they usually come from cultures where self-sacrifice is still big. And although they come here for self-fulfillment, they manage to retain that sense of, you know, children come first, families all important. Um, me, myself, and I is not the, the, at the very centre of A belief in marriage, mother, father, in marriage, children, in stay mother. together. Yes, mm. yes, but it's not just marriage, it's, it's about discipline, it's about hard work. Yeah. You know, they, they come from Poland, from Bangladesh, from, uh, from Ghana, and, and they still really believe that although they must make it, they want to keep their values intact. Mm. Douglas Murray from the Centre for Social Cohesion, this is what we need. Well, um, it's good to be talking about immigration not just in terms of economics, which mm. is what tends to happen. There's another thing, though, is that whatever um, uh, Christina says about the impact of and the feelings of uh, new immigrants, I have to say I tend to be slightly worried when I hear people like the, the judges talking about, uh, about this because I sense, I think a lot of other people do, that what we're talking about are the most reactionary uh, views of all kinds of religions, the most reactionary opinions about the family, things actually that people in this country are generally quite tolerant about. Such as? And well, I mean, things like marriage, things like homosexuality, which uh, when a judge nods to, uh, to the family values of, for instance, Islam in this country, he could do so, but he's also nodding to a very reactionary religion in relation to, say, homosexuality. Miriam, I'll bring you in here. I think it's an appropriate point, a convert. Uh, when you hear that, what about the, the fears that many have about the, the backwards uh, social attitudes of, for example, um, Islam, that people point to the attitude to women, the attitude to gays, uh, forced marriages, uh, all those things that concern people. Well, I certainly think that, um, you know, we, one has to distinguish between, you know, the faith as an ideal and how it's practiced within the community, and I'm not the first person to say that, but, um, you know, obviously there are reactionary attitudes, and I think that um, to sort of infer that immigrants are bringing in these sort of 
alien negative uh, values into British society is to somehow miss out on the fact that actually what British values are are the interaction between outside influences and the ideas and beliefs which, have, which currently prevail. Sure. And in fact, that, that brings a richness to our sure. society. Look, I mean, nobody's denying the richness that immigrants bring to society. But it's also true to say that uh, just because, um, uh, because we say, oh, well, you, this is your point of view, uh, you're entitled to it, that's fine. You, in a tolerant and open society, you should have that. But it becomes very difficult, and I think this occurs particularly with homosexuality in the West. It, it's particularly difficult when you get to a stage where you say that you have to be tolerant of people people who are intolerant to you. Well, uh, that is something that you have to reconcile as a society in which you have different perspectives. These are not, no longer out, outside perspectives. What you need to understand, and, and what I think is kind of an odd way of conceptualising this debate, is these ideas coming from the outside. You have people within the society that may not approve of well, maybe, homosexuality. Well, yeah, there are ideas, I suppose, Miriam, that, are, that, are, that could possibly bolster some indigenous ideas already here. Uh, you know, people who maybe feel they are social conservatives but ha are being marginalised in our society. Possibly. And they may find sucker from these people coming in. Possibly, or perhaps these are issues that we as a British society need to mm. rethink. Maybe these are ideas that we need to thrash out and decide where we actually stand on. These are British attitudes. I don't mm. really like the idea of conceptualising them as ideas that come from the outside. There are people within Britain that are British that do hold these ideas and to simply brush them away as the ideas of an, a minority from the outside is to not really give credit to them. Uh, you thought it was really pretty tacit, of course. Both of you. I see. Very, very keen to come in. I don't know which, which of you to choose. Peter Paul first. Peter first. Oh, go on. Peter Tatchell. Uh, I think we should be very careful about generalising. Mm. Um, immigrant communities come with lots of different backgrounds, different ideas, different influences, some cultural, some religious. Is there a danger of, of, a, of a step back to, to a place that we've escaped from socially with some of, some of the values that are being brought in? I think that is true amongst some immigrants. You know, look at, look at the Polish immigrants who are coming here. A lot of them bring a very, very conservative hardline Catholicism, which is very anti-woman, very anti-gay. Um, we see other sections of immigrant communities who condone or endorse female genital mutilation, forced marriages, domestic violence, because I think men should rule the house and are justified to abuse their women if they're disobedient. We also see honor killing of women and gay people in this country in small numbers, but nevertheless in unacceptable numbers, amongst some sections of immigrant communities. So I think there are some bad attitudes, but many immigrants do bring positive values and do enrich our society. Well, just the bad attitudes, then I'll come to Betty. And <coughs> Keith, I've got you in mind, don't worry. But, um, Miriam? Yeah, no, I think you, obviously you're going to have a hard time finding people that condone honour killings, that condone female, female genital mutilation, etc., etc. I mean, we can bring out all of these sort of pretty marginal you know experiences that people have but at the end of the day you know these are minority experiences and the vast majority of people are not these are not the issues that affect us you know that affect muslims and other minorities within this country she thought I would. but i don't think they are as little as that the forced marriage uh, the female genital mutilation honor killings the problem is because they are regarded as culturally sensitive um, even though we've got laws against them, they're not being properly policed. The, the social core workers, the police, but they're frightened to touch them. There, there, has, not, there the has not been one FGM oh, prosecution in this country. Are we in danger of being rather, rather <laughs> accentuating the negative? Uh, oh my goodness, how much more negative can you get for the poor people that are affected that we're actually betraying? We're not looking after them. But it's no a shocking thing that's values. happening. Absolutely nobody is defending these things. You bring to me a voice that's defending female genital mutilation in this country and I will All accept right. that view. Okay, view okay. Betty, are we in moral decline? You're a charismatic evangelical. Are we in a sort of moral decline that needs an infusion of morals from elsewhere? No, um... England, uh, from the onset, were the ones that went to different countries. Um, mm. They went out and they brought um, good things to countries that didn't even know about electricity. They went into poor countries, Africa, many different mm -hmm. educated people. Mm -hmm. Now, because of wars, because of um, uh, persecution, different people are coming in here. And instead of us collaborating, people want to actually impose their ideas in this country. Are we, what about um, the attitudes to gays, for example, that uh, I personally about? don't think homosexuality is a good thing. That's my belief being a Christian. I don't think two men to, should sleep together mm. or two women should sleep together, and I stand by that. Mm. What I believe in is uh, 
obviously coming here collaborating before gay people uh, came out and women. This country did not tolerate that. Was that a better time? I believe it's, it was a better time. Obviously, we need to move on. We need to move on to uh, embrace change. And um, obviously, immigrants coming in, we talked by the British then when you came in. But from the Bible, that these things are not right. It's but not good. The moral mix is Peter. I would defend Betty's right to hold those views. Well, they're, they come they're, her, that. they're her yeah. conscientious yeah. views. Where I would object is the way in which people like Betty, some people like Betty, seek to impose her morality on everyone else through the law of the land. So they want to make their morality the legal morality that binds us all. Now let me answer that. I think, I'm one not, second, like, Betty first, take yeah. to Alan Craig, and then we'll come um, to the panel. I do strongly believe you will not be sitting here if you didn't have a mother. A man and a woman. You were given that to buy a woman, a family together. And so by then, I do believe clearly that uh, being a homosexual is not a good thing. It's your choice. You are not forced oh, to be homosexual. What's wrong, Keith? I think that it, it's <coughs> not a choice for people. My goodness, the well, amount of the, the amount of oppression has been of gay about, people but... to suggest that they do it because they want to do it is just is, is just stupid. It, we've, we've all know better than that. <laughs> Mr. Masonic, is, is, is there a danger that with many of the social conservative attitudes coming into this country, it's not going to be morally good for us, it's going to take us back to a place that some argue we've moved on from? That isn't my experience. Um, most of my urban congregations now are predominantly uh, Afro-Caribbean. Mm. Uh, and uh, obviously they, they come in with, with very different values from West Africa or, or the Caribbean uh, and sometimes to... Very to different values from the Guardian and the Independent <clears throat> as well. Different values from one another in mm. terms of child upbringing, family life uh, uh, and yet we're all kind of sharing the same church. Now, now what, I, what I'm discerning in fact is, is that they are also influenced by British values uh, including mm. British values of, of tolerance. Uh, and, and the campaigning, if you like, from uh, a more conservative direction is not actually coming from those people. It's coming more from, from, from white conservative Britain, British. And oh, really? so, in a sense, we're influencing one another. And actually, from the Church of England, we're doing very well out of it because we've got somebody like John Sintamu, the, the, the Archbishop mm. of York, mm -hmm. who, who brings that energy and that passion, uh, but, it, but also brings a great deal of intelligence. So let's we're winning. Some, let's get some views from the audience as well. Gentlemen back there with uh, the red shirt. Yeah, go on. Hi, um, we've been talking about sort of morality and stuff, but in terms of the sort of big stories in the news, in terms of moral action, there have been sort of Sharon Matthews and all the sort of teenage killings. What um, relevance does immigration have to that? And that's what people seem to be most concerned about when they're talking about moral decline. Mm. They're talking about these stories, but, but where has immigration got a point in that? The, immigration, the, the argument is that there's many of the people coming in have a sort of a stronger moral framework, a stronger family background, and they would, uh, they would bolster those values within this country. People talk, Maria, about the Poles. Don't they? You came from Poland, well, when, three or four years ago? Three and a half years ago. Yeah. And um, well, I think that um, I would, would like to make a, any, any simplistic statement about this, but I think that it should be uh, the whole moral decline. It should be approached from at least a few angles. Well, to start with um, the immigrants coming to Britain, uh, I think I'm very well aware of the fact that... Um, the British society was built on the values such as democracy, mm -hmm. freedom, respect, uh, tolerance. And uh, we are guests here, actually, and uh, we want to learn and we also want to contribute to this country. There's an but, argument by mm, the, you know, the, the soccer, who are the people who deal mm, with uh, organised crime in this country, that a lot of crime has gone up because of Eastern European immigration. Gun crime, you know, other aspects of organised crime people trafficking and all that. So it's not all, you know, pious Catholics uh, packing in the churches on a Sunday, is it? Mm. There are challenges, there are problems. There are, but uh, again, you can't, um, you know, this is a immigration, um, immigrants as a group, they are a very di di uh, diverse group. Mm. So, um, you know, you can't generalise. And you, I think you need to remember about the fact that um, there are, Certain values. Which, well, we, we actually started the whole debate with these, with the with the, with the results of the poll that mm -hmm. about 83 mm. percent percent of um, of people believe that there is a moral decline, and uh, well, we can't change anything. But I think that we can perhaps influence uh, some values and uh, bring some values which, are, for example, Polish people. Uh, 
have learned under their homes, like very, very strong fa family ties. Okay, do you, do you buy that about the Polish immigration, for example, Douglas Murray? Well, I just wanted to say, I mean, uh, the polling people and asking them if they sense moral decline, I don't think you could ever take a poll anywhere at any point in our history where people <laughs> thought they were in moral ascent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. <laughs> Everything's always getting worse. That's the nature of human feeling. Yeah. So, you, you, Richard Dawkins, are you worried at all by some of the social attitudes that come into this country? I'm worried about some of the social attitudes I've heard in this hall tonight. Um, <laughs> this morning. Uh, this, this, sorry, this morning. Um, it's all dark in here. Um, I'm worried when, when uh, somebody sitting next to a well-known gay activist says, I believe that you had a mother, and gets a round of applause. Now, that's bigotry, and I'm worried about that. I'm surprised you are worried about that. Um, we are debating, and as a very intelligent man, he made a statement earlier on about why different religions are not tolerated. You, you justified no, it on biblical you, sir. grounds. Let me answer you, sir. You justified it on biblical grounds. Because in here, grounds. there are people that will believe in what we will all get applaud one way or another in what somebody else is saying. He was given birth by a woman. It was his choice to be gay, whether it was something that he inherited or not. That is what I believe, I believe that to be the truth. And so I don't personally believe that two men should live together or two women should be, that is my belief, and I stand by that. I don't care what you personally yeah. believe. Stand by what? that, and I stand by Where's that. The I don't think it's of much interest what you or anybody else personally believe. Well, everyone's entitled to their opinion. The question is, so. what is the evidence? Yeah. And there, there is no evidence that, um, as you say, you have a choice about being gay or not. Mm -hmm. You justified what you said on biblical grounds, which sounds awfully much to me like forcing your views upon other people. I guess what, I guess what this comes down to... Well, hang on, now let's, 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 please, let's not get sidetracked too much on this, but what, what this interestingly comes down to is the focus on the contention, Rabbi Shockett, that godly people are necessarily better people. Is that necessarily the case? Not necessarily the case, no. You don't have to be a godly person in order That's to right. be a good person. What needs to be put in perspective, and I think we're all deluding ourselves, mm -hmm. is the fact that no one faith has the right to impose its value system on its society. Mm -hmm. Every faith has broader values that can certainly be adopted by society. The cardinal sins, idolatry, worship of materialism today, adultery, the breakdown of family, murder in its very real sense are as rampant today as before. Immigration is making no impact is on society. Is it challenging in any sense the consensus of liberalism uh, with, 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 a, with a small l that we have in this country? Tolerance and liberalism. Is that in any way challenged by immigration? To a degree, it probably is, but only insofar as where certain societies look to impose their value system on broader society. What I choose to believe, what she chooses to believe, and Peter is prepared to accept her right to believe that, is fair enough. But if she's going to try and impose that on mainstream society, that's fundamentally flawed. The real problem... Let me just conclude with one point. Yeah, yeah. The real issue is, it's not immigration that's impacting society. Yeah. I think immigrants themselves are losing their value systems and being influenced by society. Councillor Alan King. Yas Yasmin in a second, Councillor. Um, yeah, well, I must, I, it, sure. it behoves me at this point to say, for reasons of rules and regulations, you are one of ten candidates standing for the position of Mayor of London. Carry on. Thank you very much. <laughs> get, get Ken Livingston out this way. <laughs> um, I think what we see here is what we heard from Professor Dawkins, that extraordinary arrogance, that if you have some views different from his, yeah. your views are not acceptable. There is no such thing. There, there is no such thing as a vacuum. There are therefore values in the public sphere. The question is whether you have the lady here, the Pentecostal evangelical, with whom I would identify and encourage her to speak up, or you get the arrogance that says her views are not valid. Actually, there have to be some views out there. The question is, can we live together? Can we tolerate each other? Not write one another out like Professor Dawkins she was trying to do. She made a factual statement. She's absolutely entitled to her views. Tolerance and freedom of speech we will come on to and the right to offend, but surely all our views are valid, aren't they? No, not necessarily. It depends on, on the evidence. She made a factual statement about the upbringing of gays and about whether gay people are free to change their minds or not. That is a factual statement. There is evidence bearing on it. That means that personal opinion, which is not informed by evidence, is not of interest. Yasmin, you've written, you've, written, you've written this fascinating book about your own upbringing in this country. Your parents came from. Remind me where they came from. Uh, Pakistan. Pakistan. India. Do you think, do you discern a danger that we are stepping back in time, in a sense, with some of the attitudes being brought into this country? Okay, before I go on to that, I have a real problem with discussions like this. We're talking about Britain's moral decline, and then we're looking at it through the prism of immigration. 
And it's, we're totally divert, distracting ourselves from the real problem, okay, but what Britain is today. And there is a problem. We're not looking at the kind of pressures, the fact that life has got more complex. Mm -hmm. Of course immigrants bring a lot of good values to this country. Who are immigrants? They're often the most kind of ambitious, entrepreneurial, creative people in their societies who come over here. Mm -hmm. But at some point, immigrants stop being immigrants and they have to become citizens. And that's when a, a new whole ball game starts. And now we're talking about a, a situation where, OK, what, now that the, uh, what kind of society are we going to build? How are we going to keep it cohesive with a different value system? Now, immigrants can be our social, some of them are socially conservative. If you go back to our, um, the countries they came from, you'll find a lot of progressive people. Mm -hmm. There's good and bad everywhere. So I think let's stop talking about immigration as some sort of you know, way of looking at this issue of moral decline. And let's look at sort of what Britain has become today and why we've got people like Shannon Matthews cases and this low self-esteem amongst... Although, to be fair, the question was posed in a very positive sense. Yeah. It, wasn't a, it wasn't a negative take on no, immigration. No, sure, I understand. It was, it's just it was taken it's... from a very positive point of view. Thank you for that, Yasmin. Thank you all very much for those contributions uh, uh, with our interesting sideline between Betty and Richard on the way through. As ever, the debate continues on our message board. Just log on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions and send us your thoughts on our next two topics as well. Do we have the right to offend and... Does the devil exist? Well, this week the comedian Ben Elton said that the BBC is too scared to make jokes about Islam. Uh, there were protests by Christians outside a lecture by uh, Richard Dawkins, who's here with us today. That was in Inverness. And a few months ago, the Oxford Union caused an uproar by giving a platform to Holocaust deniers. Sixty years on from the enshrinement of freedom of speech as a human right by the UN, we ask, does that mean we have the right to offend? Well, Miriam, we heard from you in, in the first debate. I'll come to you now, because the supreme irony uh, about this, this Dutch uh, film that was taken off uh, the internet, this Dutch film, the contention of the film was that uh, Islam is a violent religion, and it had to be taken off the internet because of death threats. So it kind of, some people say it kind of proves the point, but... Surely that is an argument that we need freedom of speech, we need the right to ridicule, we need the right to offend, don't we? Well, personally, I mean, I'm European through and through, and I would absolutely not want to legislate on people's right to express their opinions, um, and, and absolutely. But I, I think more worrying is why are we asking the question of, you know, do we have the right to insult? I mean, I don't walk around in my day-to-day -day thinking, I'd really like to insult somebody, but do I have the right to do it? <laughs> okay, you know, I think perhaps we should be... <laughs> Okay. What about the Ben Elton point? We've had loads of comedies. Remember, people of a certain generation, uh, you know, as old as me and older, remember Dave Allen, all the jokes about priests. We remember that we've got the Vicar of Dibley. Are we going to get the Imam of Bingham? You know, are we going to Bingley? Are we, we, you know, where is the sitcom in a mosque? I mean, actually, it's funny you say that. There's a Canadian programme called Little Mosque on the Prairie, which is a, you know, a comical <laughs> show. No, it, it is. It's Little Mosque on, uh, Little Mosque on the Do Prairie. It's a offense? comical show. And absolutely not. There's mm. been a, an astounding reaction to it. People have loved it. And they've loved the insight that this has brought into kind of the day-to-day -day of normal Muslims, you know, not the, not the ranting and raving people that we typically see on TV. Keep watching this word. We have a right... We maybe have a right to ridicule, but do we have a right to offend? A lot of it, like the cartoons, it's just gratuitous, but, isn't but, it? But directly taking that on, I've just come back from the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, and their, their intent, the Organisation of Islamic Countries, in getting international defamation of religion legislation... Uh, so, worldwide freedom of speech is going to be in pinch, and that's dreadful. It, that's what underlines our whole democracy and our civilization is freedom of speech. Fortunately, we're freedom getting to say rid anything of, you want. The, the, the dividing line, the, the line is inciting hate speech, inciting violence. You should be protecting the person, not the religion. Okay, Douglas Murray, Harris, Rafik, in a second. Do we have a right to offend? Not just a right, but because there's a necessity to offend. Um, when uh, something is standing there, it's perfectly obvious, which needs saying. I, um, I know Geert Wilders a bit who made the film in Holland. I knew the uh, people who made the last film that did this in Holland. Of course, Theo van Gogh was shot and beheaded on the streets of Amsterdam, and his colleague, Ian Hersiali, was chased into hiding. Um, people are very aware of the danger of criticizing Islam. They take the lesson from it, and a lot of people still fail, despite this, to realize the incredible irony at the root of all this, which is a group of people who say, say my religion is peaceful or I'll kill you. Yeah, but never mind that. What about Jerry Springer, the opera? What about other examples? Well, but, Jerry Springer, the yeah. but Jerry Springer, the opera, gets protests, as I gather happened the other week with uh, Professor Dawkins. You get protests, but does anyone honestly think 
that they're likely to be killed for making a joke about Jesus Christ. No, of course not. There is, there's the life of Brian. There's countless films about well, it. Lots of people are equally we, offended we, we by live, that, well, of they? course they're offended, and they have a right to be offended to it, uh, by it. But what happens when one religion manages to have a totalitarian hold over freedom of speech in it because people are genuinely concerned about criticizing it? There is a problem, and that is an unequal situation. You say one religion will be absolutely allowed to be, to be let free from all of these, uh, uh, these Harris, criticisms. Harris, I think, I think, the right to ridicule. I think I, absolutely. I think I think there's nothing wrong with ridiculing, with uh, with with criticising, with speaking up against something, whether it's religion, whether it's somebody's point of view, etc. Where I would draw the line, and I draw the line here for Muslims and non-Muslims as well, is that where there is incitement to hate and violence. Now, the, let me give you an example of this. Uh, recently, we had um, it's a thin line, though, isn't it? It's a very it's thin a line. Grey area. Absolutely. Recently, we we, we had uh, a case where uh, we had uh, Yusuf Karadawi, who uh, is a hardcore uh, Islamist, who somebody who actually um, uh, promotes suicide bombing um, in the Middle East, and rightly so, he was banned from coming into this country. Rightly so, he wasn't given a platform. And the reasons for that were that here is somebody who um, was would have been given a platform to incite this uh, hatred, would have been given legitimacy, would have been able to sprout his views. But I think in a case where we have somebody who wants to, uh, like Dave Allen or somebody else, wants to actually make some satire, make jokes about people. Britain has a history of that. We have a history of, of, of ridiculing each other, and I think there's a difference between We have hatred. a sense of ridiculousness. Abso don't absolutely. Don't there's, the a, there's, a, there's a stark difference between death threats, there's a stark difference between hatred and ridicule and mockery, and I think that's where, we have, that's where the line is drawn. What about Nick Griffin, uh, Christina Adoni? And Robert Shockett, I'll bring you in here. Nick Griffin of the BNP and also David Irving, the notorious Holocaust denier. They were given a platform recently at the Oxford Union. Was that right? Yes, we have to. We have to be able, as, as people of, of one faith or many faiths, to withstand that kind of offensive criticism, that kind of vicious attack. But what because about it, somebody who lost banning, relatives in the Holocaust, seeing that man up banning, there at the Oxford Union? Banning free speech is a cornerstone of totalitarian regimes. And they're the very ones that have been persecuting uh, religions for all the 20th century and now into the 21st. Look at the Chinese with the, with the Tibetan monks. We cannot, you know, if we want to have the moral high ground, if we as, mm. as religious people want to have the moral high ground, we we cannot play that dirty card that the totalitarian regimes R did. Shockett, yet, if we give a platform to Holocaust deniers, that's what ultimately leads into taking it to the next step of gravestones being defaced with swastikas and whatever else besides. You know, there is no such a thing, bottom line, of freedom of speech. There are always gray areas, there are always laws. I mean, if I choose to say something terribly grotesque about the Queen on national television, I mean, there are consequences for that. So Rabbi, there, is a, there, there is a bottom line that there, there is no there such is thing as freedom of speech. Rabbi. I would only say this. If you want to talk about freedom of speech, let that always be in the context of responsible speech. No, Rabbi, no, no. Rabbi. Keith Portis, Rabbi. You can have freedom of speech as long as it isn't anything too terrible. The real <laughs> point of freedom of speech is when it is terrible. And the other point is that by allowing these people to speak, and I agree for the first time for a long time with Christine, that you actually is, expose in them, in, probably, <laughs> you actually expose them to criticism and you don't have the, free, the, the speech being exactly. festered. If you, if you stop it, it festers and it, doesn't, it isn't exposed. Does it fester or does it legitimise Islamophobia, homophobia, misogyny and all the other homophobias that I can't think of right now? No. Does it not, no, no, no. not legitimise you, 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 you get it out and these people are sitting... You get it out? The people, the, if you have freedom of speech, people are allowed to, to, to criticise it and so the people who need to hear that criticism, hear it. And that's it's argued against, that's, and it's that's, defeated by words that, for Harris Rafiq. That's ridiculous. Oh, if you have somebody like Nick Griffin speaking on a platform, if you have somebody like Karadawi or Abu Hamza, all you need is one person in the audience who's going to take note of what he has to say, move forward and go and, have, go and bomb somebody or kill somebody. And, and that's where we need to draw the line. We cannot tolerate the intolerable. If something is intolerable, we must, as a society, have a collective responsibility to stop it. You, you don't have to give a platform to uh, Nick Griffin. You, the, the Oxford Union was wrong to give him a platform. But does he have a right to say if, what he says? Yes, I suppose so, just like Holocaust denials. The problem is, is that when we talk about Holocaust denial and things like this in the same uh, context as freedom of speech today, Holocaust denial is wrong for many reasons, but one of them is because it's a lie. It's a yeah. lie to pretend the Holocaust didn't happen. So you're giving a platform to a liar. When somebody says, as Gert Wilders has done, these are verses in the Quran, and these are what some Muslims do in response to that, that's not a lie. That's just, that's just a statement the, 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 of fact. The key here is the most important social freedoms and advances 
have been brought about by people who caused great offence in their time. Galileo, mm. Charles Darwin, they caused offence to the church because they spoke out against the church orthodoxy. The first people who spoke out against slavery caused great offence. Mm -hmm. Those who denounced the church and the way the church supported slavery, they were denounced and condemned for causing offence. Is there anything I could say that would uh, offend you? Well, th 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 there may be plenty of things you can say, but you have the right to say them, providing you don't incite violence against exactly. other human beings. But, well, how, do, how do we legi how, how, not legislate is the wrong word, but how do we make sure that people don't cross that line? Because it's a very grey area, isn't it? Miriam, you wanted to come back in. Well, I mean, I was going to say, there are certainly things that are offensive, but do we need to offend people by, by saying them? I mean, there's a way of saying things. We can discuss the institution of the monarchy in this country without insulting the Queen. It therefore makes it perfectly reason reasonable and possible to discuss, I think, is, the tenets okay, and beliefs then? of any other religion without insulting okay, Miriam, sensibilities. Miriam, insulting sensibilities, that's in interesting. Insu without insulting sensibilities, okay. Some Muslims think that music and dancing are haram and should be forgiven, uh, for not forgiven, wrong well, word, Freudian <laughs> slip, forbidden, yeah. haram, th that it's forbidden. So if I were to say music, forbidden, haram, that is just bonkers. Now some people are going to find that extremely offensive, aren't they? they have might. I offended sensibilities? Do I have the right to say that? I, I think that they, I think if uh, people that are used to having debates within the interfaith debates are pretty uh, familiar with the codes and practices of different religions and understand where those boundaries I, are. I and certainly that would not right? be, certainly that would not be one of those boundaries. But there are certain things that even uh, people with no religion would find offensive. Such if I was as? to come on TV and start insulting, you know, I mean, I hate to be crass, but your mother, that would be extremely <laughs> offensive. Now, we feel as strongly about our mothers as we do about the Prophet Muhammad. That doesn't mean you can't discuss what he says, the message he brings, but there's no need to be crass about Walking it. Walking down the street, you get offended. There's somebody wearing something you don't like, or you get, Absolutely. And we you get, get offended. It. It's part of being grown up. It's just accepting the fact that you get your feelings trodden upon. Does it mean you have to deliberately tread on people's feelings? No, not necessarily. Exactly. But what you cannot do is to ring fence one, and what you cannot do is to ring fence one ideology through fear, intimidation, or anything else. And that is what we see happening. That's what Ben Elson is saying. Well, 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 but Richard Dawkins, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Professor uh, you've I've obviously, I mean, a lot of people have taken offence at some of the things that you've written. You know, they feel personally offended because they feel that their, their faith, which is so dear to them, and their belief, which, is, which they cherish, has, you know, you're criticising it. Uh, do, you th do you think about that? But, but I don't you... go out of my way to offend. No, but do you think about the offended, possible consequences? If people are offended, then they may argue against me. All I use is words. There is a radical distinction between using words and, and violence and incitement to, to violence. The Salman Rushdie affair is absolutely brings this out. Mm. Salman Rushdie simply wrote a book. That's what he did. He wrote a book. He was threatened with death. He was threatened with death by baying crowds in this country. People burned his books. They demanded the death penalty. And so some leading parliamentarians suggested that some, the paperback shouldn't come out. Some leading parliamentarians, some leading clergymen, mm. some leading bishops sided with the Ayatollah Khomeini rather than sided with this very distinguished novelist who did no more than put words on paper. That is a radical distinction. Can I let Miriam come back in? I, mean, I, I this do with sort you, of feel like we're talking about issues in a vacuum here. I mean, you're talking about uh, the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. Are, are we forgetting that we're talking about Khomeini? Are we forgetting that we're talking about the 1979 revolution and the context in which that was occurring? And similarly, when we talk about, you know, the reaction, the highly unacceptable, violent reaction of some Muslims, some Muslims, I would like to add, to um, films like Gert Wilder's films and Van Gogh's film, etc., you know, we've, we're almost talking like it's completely decontextualised. It's not happening in a vacuum. Okay. Muslims around the world no, feel okay, victimised. Peter Tatchell, you're completely okay. wrong. <laughs> One of the people who supported the fatwa against Salman Rushdie was now Sir Iqbal Sakrani, a leader of the Muslim Council of Britain. He got a knighthood after saying that death was too good for Salman Rushdie. And nobody and he's a leader. He was a leader of the Muslim Council of Britain. A.L. Kennedy, do you context. think that anything goes? Yeah, I think we need freedom of speech. What, what, what alarms me more than anything is that freedom of speech has been constantly redefined as the right to offend, and it's only the negative aspects that were being shown. And that leads to absurdities like the photographs from the torture at Abu Ghraib, are redefined in terms of these photographs are offensive and are causing unrest. And you don't get the dialogue which is about it's offensive to torture people, that causes unrest, and photographs of torture. 
And you, you have this absurd situation where the more true something is, and we are quite often talking about questions of belief and questions of factual, provable truth, mm -hmm. the more true something is, the more offensive it will be. So, for example, you can't or you, you would want to watch putting uh, an article into a newspaper about a corporation because it would offend the corporation. And if it's true, you would want to be even more ca careful because it would impact even more on the share price. Right. So this, this whole kind of right to offend seems to prevent truth from appearing now. And what was so interesting in, in our earlier debate was we had a Christian evangelical who was, we have to admit, pretty offensive if you were gay, and yet Richard didn't think that that was allowed. So we are not allowed, you know, we are allowed to have Muslims um, feel yeah, offended, but not, but not Christians. I didn't say she shouldn't you speak. Richard, 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 you said that she was Christina, stupid. Allow, allow that was Richard pretty to come offensive. I, I didn't say she shouldn't speak. Of course she's free to speak. I, I simply said that her personal opinion is of no interest on a factual matter where there is evidence. Richard, what do you, you think can that always means? Have, you can always have a difference of opinion, and when there is a difference of opinion, you're pro-homosexuality, she's anti-homosexuality, so be it, you put those opinions out in the arena. Where it gets downright offensive, mm. when you're going to offend millions of people who died in a holocaust by saying it never happened, mm. that's fundamentally wrong. That's but Sir Rabbi, yeah, should, should David Irving not have been, should David should Irving be not be allowed to talk? Bishop Tom, let's go David on to the uh, final thought, thought. Bishop yeah. Tom. Yeah. Cartoons, for instance, can I just take you to a specific point? Um, there have been cartoons of, you know, God, a white man on a cloud, in, in our culture and civilization for, for eons. You know, it's not something we get concerned about. Why should we make special rules for other people? But there are different cultures. I mean, what was it 10 years, 15 years ago, Spitting Image uh, portrayed Jesus Christ as a hippie. We weren't terribly pleased about it, but it, we live with that culture. The Muslim community in this country said, he's one of our prophets. You don't denigrate our prophet. The in life that kind of Brian of was, was a similar was now, now, actually, wasn't now, it? now, actually, that was a very interesting kind of uh, uh, meeting of different, different cultures, different habits. And if we're going to share one country, and if we're going to have social cohesion, we've got to res respect one another and think before we act. So, I, 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 Britain is one of the I, most... I, I have not got the freedom here now to shout fire, because if I do... A if lot of people are about safe, you would. You and, do have the and, right. If it's on fire, you should shout fire. Yes, but if it's not on fire, you don't shout fire. There's no, a limit to fire. So we, have to, so, so we have to watch our P's and Q's. We have to watch about shouting fire in the public arena if that is going to damage our social media. Britain, Britain, Britain is one of the most multicultural, multi faith countries in the world. And it's just not possible to carry on in a way you don't offend anyone. The answer is we don't have the right not to be offended, any of us. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, do you agree with what's been said? Whatever you say about what's been said, I'm going to defend to the death your right to say it. Uh, send your views to our message board. Let us know what you think about our last debate. Does the devil actually exist? So, uh, Richard, um, Professor Richard Dawkins, you've already made a glittering appearance on our programme this morning, um, which has uh, stimulated a lot of debate. I wanted to ask you, actually, about... So I've read a lot of your books. Um, the great religious figures. I know we've got some questions from the audience as well in a minute. Because somebody sent you a T-shirt. I know it was after... I think it was after a lecture you did. Um, I saw this on YouTube. It was uh, Atheists for Jesus. Explain that one. And also the figure of Jesus Christ, this extraordinary figure. What do you make of him? I wrote an article called Atheist for Jesus, making, uh, making the point that he was a very good man, a, a great uh, moral philosopher. As an individual, I don't think that the, um, that the Christian values that say that he died for our sins or redeemed our sins, the idea of a sort of scapegoat who, who dies for other people's sins, especially dies for Adam's original sin when Adam didn't even exist, um, I, th I don't think that that's great, but Jesus himself... How do you himself, know Adam didn't exist? Sorry. I'm sorry, look, I'm a scientist, and we, we know that, that, well, there may have been an individual, um, <laughs> but, but um, Adam, in the, in, the, in the biblical sense, as I'm quite sure the bishop will, will agree, did not exist. Now, um, the point I was making is that Jesus, as an individual, uh, was, a, was, a, was a very good man, and I made the slightly tongue-in-cheek suggestion that if Jesus were alive today, he'd probably be an atheist. That, that was all that 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 article was about. What sort of a character do you think he was? You say he was a very good man. Do you think he was an extraordinary charismatic character? Yeah, he was a, he was a charismatic preacher, clearly, uh, and um, he, he, he clearly had the ability to, um, to, to uh, excite people to follow him. 
so I think he was clearly a very, a very re remarkable man. Needless to say, I don't think he performed any miracles. I don't think he was built born of a virgin. And I don't think he thought he was the son of God. And you think he's gone to dust and no more and there is no trace of him anywhere else? It's all, it's all over. plenty of trace of him in people's minds and ah, books, but, mm. but, but no trace of Jesus as an individual now. Mm. Your, your, your whole um, campaign at the moment um, is, is fascinating because you've got, it's almost like a crusade for reason. You've got the Richard Dawkins Foundation. And we've heard your passion this morning. You think it's very important to put these arguments out there, don't you? Very important to put arguments out there, not in an intolerant way, I hasten to add. I'm sorry if I came across as, as wanting to suppress people's freedom of speech. Absolutely not. I'm all in favour of freedom of speech. Hmm. All, all, all I was saying was that personal opinions are of less interest than um, uh, evidence-based views. And it is not that difficult to find evidence. There's plenty of... We have very, very good scientific methods for discovering what's true about certain things. For example, in the case of Holocaust denial, as somebody said problem with that is that it's a lie. Um, and the, creationism, the, similarly, the, is, the, that, yes. is that a lie? Yes. Um, the Holocaust did happen. Evolution did happen. The evidence for both is absolutely overwhelming. People always say with evolution, the, the, the question they always ask is, well, where then, it's, it's a fantastic theory, but where then and will we ever find that definitive missing link between ourselves and the apes? Let me start with Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Australopithecus africanus, of Australopithecus afarensis, Ardipithecus orarin. Where do you want to That's start? It's easy for you to say, Richard, I've got to say. Well, um. don't use 19th century um, language then, using words like missing link. Yeah. That was way, way back. Nowadays we have lots and lots of links. Okay. Um, Christina, I think you've got a question. Yes. Richard, if I preceded a, a question to you and, and said, um, atheists like Adolf Hitler, Richard Dawkins, and Joseph Stalin, dot, 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 would you take umbrage? I would take umbrage, but I would defend your right to say yes, it. Yes, but I know, but, but what I wanted to point out is that most of your writings, in most of your writings, when you talk about religious people, you, you, you pluck out figures like um, the pilots who um, uh, drove the airplanes into the... Um, and no, I, State Billy. Okay. You, um, you pluck out people like the inquisitors of the Grand Inquisition, um, people like Jerry Fowell, and you must accept that for, for those of us who are of, uh, people of faith, to take these extremes, these horrible, horrible extremes, um, sinners in all our eyes now, um, as representative of our faith is as, is as offensive I, as professor, you being lumped professor. with um, Adolf and Joseph. <laughs> Christina, if you had read my book, The God Debate... Darling, have I read your book? I you would not wrote say your that. book back. Um, uh, first, Adolf Hitler was a Roman Catholic. You Stalin... know full well that he was a Roman Catholic born, but he lapsed and he and... became an atheist. God speaks on us. Um, that is disputable. It, the, the, point, the real point I want to make is that it is actually irrelevant because I don't, as a matter of fact, make points by picking on particular individuals and saying... There's a whole chapter in the one, 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 one second. The, the difference, between, the difference between taking somebody like Hitler and taking somebody like the pilots who flew into the World Trade Center is, or Stalin. Stalin may have been an atheist, he was an atheist, but Stalin did not do his terrible deeds in the name of atheism. The people who flew planes into the World Trade Center precisely did their terrible deeds in the name of religion. They were righteous people. They believed they were doing right. Okay. They believed they were doing the will of Allah. Right, okay. Well, it's interesting because they, they were, it was a, in a sense, it was a kind of secular religion, wasn't it, communism? Uh, we've got Lara. Quick question yes. from Lara. Then we shall uh, move it on to our last debate. Where is Lara? Hi. Oh, they're right up there. I've been <laughs> at the wrong side. A very quick question, and Professor, if I can ask you for a brief answer. Laura. People believe in God because it provides them with a sense of hope. And without God, where would that sense of hope derive from? OK. Um, first thing to say about that is that the universe does not owe you a sense of hope. It could be that the world, the universe, is a totally hopeless place. I don't, as a matter of fact, think it is. But even if it were, that would not be a good reason for believing in God. You cannot say, I believe in X 
whatever X is, God or anything else, because that gives me hope. You have to say, I believe in X because there is some evidence for X. In the case of God, there is not a tiny shred of evidence for the existence of any kind of God. But you, do you see enough, you see enough, but you, do you see enough, as, 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 as reading your books, I mean, there is, there is something to be said for what you say about, you see enough in the beauty, for example, the, the scientific beauty of a rainbow to, to inspire you. That's the second point I was coming on to, is that there's plenty of reason for hope in a godless world. The, the universe is a beautiful place, the world is a, is a beautiful place. To understand it in a clear-eyed, open-eyed way, to look out at the world and to, and to really understand why we exist, what it's all about, that is a hugely uplifting feeling. That really does give a sense of worth to life, even if life itself is finite, as I believe it is. Uh, nevertheless, um, it is not a hopeless life with, without a God. And to revert to my earlier point, even if it were, then it's just l illogical to say that, that's a, that that gives you evidence for the Richard, belief in God. here endeth the lesson. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Richard Dawkins. And, uh... I think we could have gone on all morning and all afternoon as well uh, with uh, questions for Richard. Um, but uh, be prepared for some after the programme is off the air. I'm sure people will be colouring you and asking you some stuff. Richard has been called um, the devil incarnate by the American religious right. Our next debate is about the real devil, if indeed he is real. In some faiths, Satan is a very real entity, a force for evil to be struggled against in everyday life. To others, he's the godhead of hedonism who deserves his own following. But to the many children who've suffered abuse because adults believe they were possessed by the devil, he's been an excuse for the most terrible cruelty. Does the devil exist? Uh, Betty King, do you believe the devil exists? I do believe he exists, but not to be feared. Not to be feared? Yes. He can he, be conquered? Yes, not to be feared. Um, I speak as an African woman, as mm -hmm. a black woman. Obviously, I'm British now. But um, I will share from personal experience why I do believe it does. It does exist, but not can, to can, be feared. Can the devil possess people? Yes, I personally have cast out demons out of people um, that were possessed by the devil. I have done that. How did you know they were demons? Very simple. How can you justify a very intelligent man, and I mean very intelligent, a very successful businessman that had gone through depression for years and been to the doctor? He knows there was something wrong with him. The doctors couldn't diagnose what was wrong with him. Sitting down with this person through counseling, uh, you realize there was something really at work in his life because he really could These have mental health issues, aren't they? No, not necessarily that. Um, it was not mental health. It was something that he knew was wrong inside of him, in his stomach okay. area. And, and have you heard voices and strange... <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes you get people speaking in a, a very funny, a different language. You know, and uh, they, their voice change. You Can know. children be possessed by the devil? You know, it's a very sad uh, um, when, you know, some, some, I mean, what happened to Victoria Columbia mm. was just the saddest thing, you know, that happened. I don't believe that what happened to her Maybe her was aunt right. was possessed by the devil. Well, you know, you, we, we heard through the, uh, through the justice system, you know, what had gone on. So I do believe that what had happened to both the, uh, the girl Victoria and the uh, and both of them obviously were, de were demonized. They were demonized. Yeah. Christopher, because you, 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 your, your case is absolutely horrific um, because your former foster mother, Eunice Spry, is in prison now, isn't she? For, she was sent down for 14 years. Yeah. What you went through from the age of three? Three years old, yeah. Because, and every time you were naughty, she said... Well, she thought that we were possessed by the devil. That we were Satan's children. Uh, she was a Jehovah's Witness, and Jehovah's Witnesses do believe in Satan, and that Satan can uh, send demons down into people. Oh, you, I mean, as a poor little wee boy, you must have believed that. Uh, we generally did. You yeah. know, uh, every slight thing I did wrong, I thought, is the devil making me doing this? Yeah. Is the devil inside me? And when it's been drummed into you day after day, you do believe it. And isn't, don't spare us the, the details. Tell us some of the things she made you do. Well, there's just... To uh, rid yourself of the devil. A huge number of things. Uh, she was determined to beat the devil out of us, literally. Uh, she would beat our feet 
hours on end because the feet don't bruise so there'd be no scars. But we would be this, just led on the floor screaming and then to shut us up she'd shove sticks down our throats so we couldn't scream for help. Uh, she, made, she made you drink your own vomit? She did, yeah. Uh, we were made to drink bleach, TCP, anything to rid us of the devil. And she was determined to save us you know, from Judgment Day. Isn't that the danger of... Uh, and listen, thanks for your coming on and talking about this. Yeah. Isn't there a danger? With you, can't, can't think, OK, Betty, you want to come back? If yeah. you believe this claptrap, isn't this where it can lead? I'm really sorry that you went through that, Claire. She, she, she was the devil. Was she? Because nobody clearly came to save She was just a it. very bad person, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, I mean, a person, a child. You're looking after a child. You know, how can anybody looking after a child? You know, take, uh, put a child through that. I believe that she was the one that had the problem. But Councillor, what do you say about the, 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 what, what some people would contend, that if you start believing this superstitious claptrap, that's where it can lead? Well, uh, it's rather like Christina was pointing out to the professor down there. That actually, yeah. if you take the worst examples it, 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 to try and illustrate your point, it, does, mm. it doesn't make your point. And all of us would have sympathy for him and yeah. what he's gone does through. Does the devil but exist? That, that doesn't, of course the devil exists. There's absolutely no doubt about the devil. How else to explain phenomena as we're talking about, like Hitler, like Stalin, like Mao Zedong and so on? How do you explain these great historical... Yeah. Um, devastating uh, effects unless you actually say there is a devil behind it. You can explain it other ways, of course, but actually the most satisfying way of saying it, actually there is a devil. Just as there is a god, there is also a devil. And that is what's, what's actually undermining it all. There is no other satisfactory explanation. But it isn't just there's individuals. No other, no, let's, individuals. Let, let, let's focus on this. There's no other satisfactory explanation for the great manifestations of evil in history. Oh, of course there are. I mean, look at what's happened in the, in the Orkney child abuse situation where we haven't moved on very no, far Alan from the Salem witch no, trials. Alan says there's no other satisfactory explanation for Hitler. Oh, of course there is. It's an ideology. That was the problem. It was nothing to do, nothing to do with religion. But I mean, we think we've moved on, but we haven't. I mean, the, the, there's a witch finder general in, 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 every, in every bishop's, uh, in, in every uh, diocese. Have you got one? To, have you got uh, as, as, an ex, as an exorcist, <laughs> there is an exorcist in every C of E diocese. There is the, the Roman Catholic pages, Church has got um, them too. May, Bishop may, I, may I? I mean, yes, th please. This, this is this is scandalous. We have, <laughs> we have, I have, I have, I have, in, I have in my diocese, as in other dioceses, an advisor on, on healing, and what one of his responsibilities is to protect us. From, from, from this kind of yeah. dabbling in, in, in dangerous, diabolical... Why is it uh, dangerous? If be, it, because it's for the reasons we've heard. That means it must exist. Because, because, because it, it, it's dangerous in the sense that it confuses genuine mental illness uh, with, 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 with sometimes spiritual problems. And, and the more that one gets excited about casting out demons and devils, the less chance there is that one is going to bring healing and wholeness and health to people. And Are you saying they don't do exorcisms? What, what, I do say, what, I, what I do say is that I think the, if we go back to uh, the basics of the Bible in terms of the devil, the Bible sees the devil as a fallen angel. And that, I think, is an extremely good image, because if one looks at Hitler, if one looks at Stalin, if one looks at Pol Pot, if one looks at the... At, 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 at the, 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 okay, the I don't think... Is it an analogy, though? It's, it's, no, no, is it, it is more than... The than devil exists? It is more than an analogy. It is an angel that has gone wrong. Something that has been good, somebody who's had a, a strong vision for the good of society, once it goes wrong, if it goes wrong, it can be diabolical. So and gentlemen, that's about, gentlemen about there, yeah. Yeah, I just yeah. want to say, um, Go on. in today's society, we've got paedophiles, serial killers, teenagers killing other teenagers. If that's not the devil, then what is it? What makes these people do what they do? Well, no, the, 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 the devil no more exists than Father Christmas or the Tooth Fairy. Yeah, yeah. Let's look for the evidence. When we want to know the Hitler, facts, Hitler, we look, we look, we look for evidence that the devil or anybody else exists. You know, where is the empirical evidence that the devil exists? It's, it's a superstition, it's a, it's a fanciful religious idea, which has no basis in fact, no, 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 not a no, no, shred no, no, of evidence. No, 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 no. If, if, if someone produced the evidence, I'd be quite happy to the, believe the it, but there the is no evidence. The, the evidence is the Holocaust. How else can you explain the Holocaust except by saying there is a devil, a personal being, mm. who actually designed to get rid of those six million people. There is no other... Hitler didn't himself. OK, it there was is a devil. no other satisfactory explanation Professor for Richard it. Dawkins, <laughs> how else do you explain the Holocaust? I'm just astonished that anybody in the 21st century can 
can use this kind of medieval, pre-medieval oh, superstition. Yeah. Well, that's Look, no Hitler was a very bad man. Hitler was a loony. Um, and the, the, the real mystery about Hitler is how did he come to power? How do we let Social e people... economic circumstances. There are, plenty of, there are plenty of people like Hitler who are extremely bad, extremely wicked, extremely mad. But he Mostly didn't kill they don't six million people. Power. His system killed six million people. In other words, the devil behind him That's killed right. six million people. It was million. an ideology. He didn't he didn't call call I don't devil. think he killed one of them himself personally. I know. Why, why would you bring in some supernatural force when what, what we're dealing with is, a, is, a, is an evil man with a, com with a country in great economic deprivation, a country that was felt very bitter about losing the First World War? There are all kinds of complicated historical reasons. But they aren't fully explanatory. This was, this was an evil unparalleled and a, and a descent into barbarism. And, from, you know, from, a from a civilized society. From a civilized society, which is the point that Arlen Craig makes there, unparalleled in history. Would you explain it by diabolic means? I think if you were going to suggest that it was out of Hitler's hands insofar as it having been the devil per se, then to all intent and purposes, from a religious perspective, you couldn't hold him accountable. Wow. Um, I think you have to reflect on the fact that from a Jewish perspective, there is good in the world and there is evil that exists. Does there the devil exist? The devil... <laughs> The only time the devil appears in Jewish folklore is when he turned up in a synagogue one Saturday, scared everybody out except for the elderly rabbi, and when he asked him, why aren't you scared, he said, because I've been married to your sister for 42 years. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the concept of evil, per se, does exist in order for there to be the balance and free choice in the world. In other words, a world that enables a man to make himself into, say, a Moses, has to also enable a man to turn himself into a Hitler. Does anyone believe that the devil can actually appear in human form? Does anyone... There's good and bad in all of us. Nice. There's light, dark and there's light. There has to be the balance. Hey, okay, what, do you you make of, what do you make of this, this so the belief in the devil? As I think it's hugely um, dangerous. It, it, at a certain level, it's, it's like a five-year-old breaking something and saying their imaginary friend did it. I mean, yeah, you have yeah. to take responsibility for your actions. And if you're looking at something like the Holocaust, if you want to look at how you prevent that, mm. The one way not to prevent it is to say, oh, well, the devil descended and made X number of million people kill X number of other million people. You have to look at the individual stages and the individual actions and the structure that made people feel not responsible for their actions. You know, it was, it was a horribly well-designed way of killing millions of people. Mm. And if it's just that uh, somebody with wings turned up and made it happen, then you have no way horns, to stop it. Horns, not wings. You've got it wrong. Oh, horns, wings, hooves, <laughs> tails. Alan, how, how can I stave off the devil? Who do you want Alan to do Craig. From? Alan Craig. Well, it's simple from a Christian point of view, you stave him off by Christ. It's in Christ you stave off the devil. It's simple, it's not complicated. But I, what I, can I, 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 do, I mean, do those, well, people, those people. Every man is created in the image some of Some evangelical Christians say that. Do you, do, do you exclude the possibility? That he's the devil? Mm. Um, he doesn't. I don't know what a devil looks like, but obviously, um, <laughs> you know, if that's him, then I, I want to have a word with him. But, but, you know, but let, me, let me answer the question. Hold on. Very quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so many things that is being said here today. Whether the devil exists. Um, yes. He does as but not to be feared. I say not to be feared because of my faith in Christ. And everybody needs to believe. We all need to believe in something for us to so don't but, but go there. Let me finish. Because patience is a virtue. I think you two should have lunch after the show. <laughs> I think that would be a, a, a nice end to but the, the, to the big, to the big question. That, yeah. Some people are saying that the devil is a force in the world. There are forces in the world like gravity, like radiation, yeah, like electricity. It, we've got to leave we it. Can do scientific uh, may the force be with you. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. <laughs>